Um, we welcome a young man here, Ewan Pearson. So I think this is our chance to get him Hello. back here. I like the young man, but... No. Well, it's all about the flattery. <laughs> I like a bit of an old fart or veteran. Um, veteran in what sorts? Were you being Flanders, 1480? <laughs> I'm 33 now, so I suppose I thought about this the other day. I've been doing this for on and off for 10 years now, which is slightly scary. Ten slightly years. scary thought. Well, but then you're still kind of a late bloomer if you started with 23, kind of. Have you been involved in musical affairs before that? Um, I did the usual thing of um, bands and things when I was a kid. I mean, I'm quite lucky that I come from a, I don't know, I come from a family where music was just a massive part of, um, well, just a massive part of family life. And my, my dad has played guitar in bands as a hobby since he was a kid. Mm -hmm. um, so I grew up, I mean, I grew up with kind of things like lots of folk music and, um, my dad kind of playing in guitar bands and pub rock bands. I actually played keyboards in a band of his once when I was a teenager, which was, a, you know, did the whole sort of going around in a van thing. And, and then I had a band when I was at school, but we were kind of synth pop. We were a synth pop duo. And I was a singer because I was the least bad. We were, we were quite terrible, actually. But um, Where well was that? That was when I was at high school. Hey. I mean, you, where on God's earth is Kidderminster? Um, Kidderminster is in the West Midlands of England. Mm -hmm. um, it's about half an hour from Birmingham. How many times do you play in a club that's empty? Um, actually, I, I'm trying to think, what was the last time I played in a club that was empty? I played in a club, my, one of my favourite clubs in Germany, called the Robert Johnson, which is uh, in Frankfurt. And it's one of the best small clubs in Europe. Unfortunately, that night, Ricardo Villalobos was playing at the enormous Club Cocoon, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was snowing. And that was, there were about 40 people there, and I was kind of, yeah, it was disappointing. But yeah, but depending on where you put the bar in, no one, no, it's it a great still club. be a good night. Though. It's better to have nobody there than to have lots of people there not dancing, mm. all scowling at you. When was the last time that happened? Um, it hasn't happened in a while. I tried to block those kind of nights out. So. How do you identify them when you get requests for booking? How do I identify? I mean, when you say you're blocking them out, you must have found some sort of way to block them out, or? Oh no, I mean, I, I, you rely on, um, you rely on your, this sort of, you rely on your agent, and you rely on playing in places that you know. You know, after a while, you you build up a kind of connection with certain promoters and certain venues, and I'm I'm. Unfortunately, not DJing as much uh, as I could do at the moment, just because I'm trying to do more production again. I was DJing a lot last year, and uh, it's time to push the balance back. So um, it's probably an interesting thing for most in here, the whole agent thing. I mean, how do you find an agent, and how do you develop a relationship that's... I mean, you've got to develop some sort of trust there, right? Um, yeah, it's... It's an odd thing. I mean, my t basically, I don't know. I'm, I'm I'm a producer that happens to DJ. I'm not a DJ. I'm, I did it the wrong way around. I did it. I made records for the last ten years. Who um, says it's the wrong way around? To well, start it's with? it was always kind of traditionally the other way around. You know, that DJs would then become producers, mm. and uh, these days it tends to be the other way around. It's actually really hard for people to break in. <coughs> it's really hard for people to break in as. DJs exclusively, you know, most of the new DJs and um, in my field certainly are, have been producers first, and it's certainly a way of it's a way of getting your head above the parapet. Whereas um, only a few people come through come through the ranks from being residents and, and DJing like that. But I mean, I was just doing a club with a friend of mine in London. Um, for a while, and then I used to play live. I used to used to do my music live with an MPC setup and a little filter and a little effects box. And um, this is this is before everybody was using laptops, before things like Ableton. So it would have been much more exciting to do the live thing um, with a program like Ableton. 
I guess that goes for a lot of people that you don't actually set out and got your Excel sheet ready to go. But nevertheless, you do reach a certain stage when you got the feeling that you can't handle it anymore on your own. Like, and then, you know, all these, like, do I need a manager? Do I need an agent? What do these people actually do for me? And what do I do for them? And are they just ripping me off? And all they... Yeah, um, it's... When it comes to taking on other people to work with you, when you get to that point where you need to take things further, I mean, I, I'm, I can only speak for myself here, and I, I'm, I'm very much of the opinion that I only ever wanted to work with people that I liked and had a genuine relationship with. I mean, my DJ agent is somebody that I've known for six or seven years, and she was a really good friend of mine before she started repping me as a DJ. Um, and my, the, the guy that manages me now um, was somebody I met, actually. He was a lawyer, he was an entertainment lawyer, and um, he did the first ever record contract that I had to sign. And I got on well with him and just kept in contact with him. And then he moved out from the law firm and into management. And I don't know, for me, it's, I mean, I'm, I, I'm a bit of a control freak. It was, a, it was interesting listening to Amir Thompson yesterday talking about sort of being the neurotic, anal, retentive one. But I'm like, I kind of want to be in control of everything I do. And so for me, um, yeah, it has to, I have to have a really good relationship with people like that before I'm prepared to work with them. Um, it's not just about, for me, it was, certainly wasn't, I mean, I could have joined, I could join kind of big management people now. Um, but at the moment, I don't know. It seems to be better to work with people who are kind of tight and close. And also, I don't know. I need I need a bit of. I think I need sort of business. I need help with business side of things. And it's always good to have somebody to say no on your behalf. Mm. That's kind of basically what you end up paying. That's what I end up paying a manager for. It's just to sort of um, to kind of to kind of block things basically. But from a creative point of view, I'd kind of I'm a bit obstinate and I make most of the decisions. <coughs> most of the decisions myself. So. so that way you can always keep up your air of being the pure artistic guy and someone else can be like, oh no, if I'm not getting uh, Well, it, hel it helps. I mean, you do, yeah. You, I mean, a, a manager is in many ways, um, you know, is, is, is a kind of professional asshole. I mean, mm. that's without, you know, on your behalf, you know, he, my manager is an asshole, so I don't have to be, so. Or so I can pretend to be really nice. <laughs> and I can be an asshole in secret. So um, obviously you chose him because you know he's not an asshole and nevertheless something goes wrong and if you now have a personal relationship with that guy or that woman in that case, how do you go on about that without, you know, like obviously this, some email did not get sent, some call did not, wasn't returned or whatever, whatever, some mess up and then you're there and you may be talking to your best friend and like you have to, yeah, you have to be, you have to be really tight, and you have to be able to say when, like, he'll say when he thinks I'm being foolish or I'm making a mistake, and I'll moan at him when likewise. So you have, and you have to be able to say these things, and then put it to one side and get on. When you were in this, this hand-to-mouth kind of phase and you were struggling for remixes and stuff, I mean, how did you go about it? Were you were the annoying one that went like, hello, I am Ewan and um, I can do the best remix No, No, again, that's another reason why it's good to have people representing you. I'm really bad at self-promotion. Um, you know, you meet different people. You meet the people who are kind of, you meet people who are sort of hustlers and hustlers by nature. Um, and I'm not, I've been sort of, I've always been the kind of quietly getting on with it and I mean basically the shape of my career has been I started off making, came out of college, made a couple of independent dance records in the UK for fun because that's the only thing I'd ever really wanted to do was just to get a bit of something I did onto a vinyl and then I got offered a, an album contract by Soma Recordings in Glasgow, one of the first sort of good 
independent labels in which were already slightly established at that stage. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, I I think I put out my first single with them was Soma 22. So mm. yeah, and they're they're up to sort of 180 something, 190 mm. now. Um, but there was already past Daft Punk mixes and stuff on there. It was yeah. around the same time as Daft Punk, um, and they have Slam and. Mm. Punk Devoid and various people. Um, so you already were just by association with that label in a pretty yeah, good Yeah, it was setting, great. I mean, they were they were a label that I'd been a big fan of since they started. Mm -hmm. I had all their records, and uh, I just, I mean, my only I suppose that, that it wasn't hustling, but I did. I just went up to Glasgow. I went to, was going to a party actually, a friend, mm -hmm. of, um, a friend of mine from college, and I just went into a record shop. Um, with a demo, kind of classic stuff, really. And then they said, have you been in touch with Soma? Yeah. And I just rang them up and said, I've got this demo, can I bring it around? <coughs> and I brought it into the office and dropped it off and got a call a couple of weeks later saying they really wanted to put it out. So it's, that's as much as, you know, that's as much kind of hustling as I ever did. And then gradually, you know, I did an album with them and some singles and got offered little label remixes, but it just all trickling slowly, slowly, slowly until two or three years ago when the remixes for some reason seemed to, I don't know, it, it, I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. I think there was a kind of, um, a certain kind of more electronic, um, electro, whatever you want to call it, influenced sound came in and a record that I, a remix that I did as a favour for somebody turned into quite a big record in 2002. Two. Yeah, and ended up being, God, it was voted best remix of the year in German, the German Darts Awards, which was strange. I never won anything before in my life, mm. and I haven't since. Um, let's take it back to that Soma stage, and you're there, you're a fan of a label, you got something in there like, Oh wow, I want to be part of that kind of thing and oh, they even like what I do. Now, there comes this lawyer guy in and you're like, uh, what is all this nonsense? And I mean, to most people, a contract is a pretty scary thing. How um, did you go about that then? Um, after a while, you, and it's, I don't know, I mean, it, it helps to have a manager who's also a lawyer, as I did, but also after a while, I'm kind of a great believer in self-sufficiency. I kind of think that you ought to, like if you're a recording artist or a remixer and you're getting contracts all the time, then it takes you a while, but after two, after a couple of years, you know, you begin to learn how to read them. Mm -hmm. um, you can't do everything yourself, but it helps to be as informed as possible. And it's a good idea to, you know, it's a good idea to read these things and not just to, or to <coughs> hand them on to somebody else. It's a good idea to, yeah, to take a, um, a bit of responsibility for yourself so, as well. So, but, but yeah, you have, to, you, know, you have to rely on other people when you're starting and you have to take people's advice. But um, yeah, don't, I mean, my approach was, was, it was a modest two album deal. Um, two albums, eight singles. Um, and you know there wasn't it's for a little independent label um, you know there's no there's no great advances space for kind of, yeah the advances were pretty pretty small so you know there's no enormous room for again for argument it's mm. it's it was fairly standard the one thing I the only thing we argued about was publishing and I would strongly advise any anybody who's signing a deal with an independent um, with stuff that they're writing themselves, don't sign the publishing to them. Just don't, don't across the board. Lots of people will, will expect you to, will ask you to as part of it. Don't do it, don't ever do it. Because the agencies that are responsible for collecting publishing like PRS and, in, and MCPS in Europe and the equivalent ones in America do a fine job of of collecting the basics, and basically, once you have something, once you have a, uh, once you have a body of work that's worth something, you can get a publishing deal. 
you know, um, and you can get your own publishing deal with a publisher who will, whose job it will be to then maximise the collection of revenue for you. Whereas, um, I mean, if you do a, there's it with a lot of, a lot of complicated or big sounding words in there. I mean, okay. what is it in a nutshell that a publisher does in the first place? Well, a publisher, there's two types of publishing. There's um, copyright in music in here is in, in two places. It's in um, mechanical and broadcast. So basically, for every <laughs> single copy of a record of yours that gets made, um, the record company has to pay uh, a mechanical royalty, which is um, basically they're paying for the right to reproduce the um, the actual recording, the sound recording that you've made. Um, and that comes to you eventually. Um, and then there's broadcast royalties, which, you know, radio play, um, TV licensing, and so forth. Speaking of remixes, I mean, like, okay, I'm going like, wow, I, wa I want you to remix my track. Or probably uh -huh. the other way around, because it might be more interesting for me. So, um, what can I expect as an up-and-coming artist to get out of it, apart from exposure? To get out of a, of a remix. Of a remix. There's a, I don't know that the, there are so many different. I mean, I think remixing is a is a in dance music is a brilliant um, artistic. You know, I think it's I think it's it's a. a it, you can look at it from a commercial point of view, or you can look at it from an artistic point of view. Um, I mean, I think it's a valid art form, certainly, in its own right. And yeah. um, the idea of versioning, you know, and, and making new, and, and cross-pollination, and getting new people's interpretations <laughs> of um, your material. Or you can look at it from a, from a hard-headed business point of view and say that it's about putting, you know, Putting a, putting a piece of music in a new context and then getting it more published, more exposure and more publicity through making it into a club hit or, you know, from changing it from one form, from a hip-hop track or rock track to a house yeah. track or whatever. I mean, you can look at it from the hard-nosed business point of view or you can look at it from the, um, the artistic point of view. Let's do both, then. Pardon? Let's do both. Then. Okay. Um... <laughs> I mean, obviously, especially in places where there's like a heavy concentration of music industry, like London, yes. you've got micro genre X, Y, Z comes around, and whatever major will make sure that whatever major artist they have at the time will have to do a remix by the hot kid on this and that pirate, pirate station and so on. Yeah. Can you explain that mechanism a little bit? Um, well, it's just, I mean, and that's that element of remixing is just buying, it's buying some cool, hmm. basically. It's, um, it's buying some cachet from somebody else. It's, hmm. it's yeah, it's, um, it's, yeah, it's using whoever's, whoever's the, the hot person at the moment to make your major label artist hmm. um, look or sound cooler than they are, um, which sounds very cynical. <laughs> sounds but, very cynical, but I mean, on the one hand, a couple but, of people got cars out of it, and other people well, got their labels and no, infrastructures. But, but then, you know, if you're careful about it, and I, I mean, I do a lot of remixes for, I do remixes for major labels, but I try to be, <laughs> I try to be really, really careful about the things that I do, and I try to pick them, I try to pick things that are going to produce um, a result with some merit, you know. I, I'm I'm not I'm not doing the, I mean I'm doing this to make a living, but at the same mm. time I'm not just doing this for the money. Um, Can you remember when you first realised, probably as a kid, that a song is not necessarily finished by the time it's on the record, but then there might be other versions or remixes and whatnot? Yeah, I think my I think when I first started to realise that. Um, one of the labels that I really liked when I was young was um, Trevor Horn's label, ZTT, that put out um, Frankie Goes to Hollywood and The Art of Noise, and there's this amazing German group called Propaganda that I really love. Um, 
and they just used to they used to churn out mixes. Um, they used to put out 12 inch after 12 inch after 12 inch, and at the time in the UK, if you put a new 12 inch out every week, and then people bought of an existing single, and people carried <laughs> on buying the those 12 inches, then you could keep the record in the charts because there was no restriction on the amount of um, formats which contributed to its chart placing. So they used to just put more and more new 12 inch versions out. But um, I loved the music and I loved the, um, and I used to kind of buy these different versions. And again, this is somewhere where art and commerce kind of, you know, they're obviously doing it for cynical commercial reasons, but at the sa same time, you get, you can get some amazing um, so creative do. results. Mm -hmm. But if I get my maths right, um, and you're 33, and by the time Dr. Mabuse came out and that kind of stuff, you were not legit to go into a club and stuff, while a lot of the music was specifically designed for particular club environments. <clears throat> yeah, well, I didn't really, I mean, I was, my first, the first dance music that I really loved was um, basically like high energy and Italo disco. It's kind of this kind of really like, and I didn't realize when I was um, a naive young man, you know, that I did the, uh, that my, my, basically my first love was kind of really, um, really gay disco, basically really gay electronic disco, and uh, and which I still love to this day, um, and a, a tallow disco, and um, I had no idea about context. I mean, I just heard these records, in I heard the records that made it across to the to the charts um, in the UK, the ones that crossed over. Obviously, I wasn't hearing them in a club context. I was yeah. hearing them um, first and foremost as pop records. Yeah. And then it was only later when I um, got older and started going to clubs myself that I, um, that I under started to understand dance music in its actual context. What did you like about Trevor Horn's aesthetic approaches? For me, Trevor Horn, um, I like the fact that it was, um, I think I like the scale of it. You know, this this was a time in the in the mid '80s when people were, uh, <coughs> you know, technology is as as sped on to such a degree now. But then, you know, your samplers were incredibly expensive, and you've got you like Fairlight musical computer that cost, you know, cost Some the best digits, part of a, yeah. Cost, yeah, cost the best part of a million. Um, you know, and this this laptop will do you know, 20, 40 times what these things could do. And you'd have these people, you'd have an operator for that, and, you'd, and there's another, another machine called Synclavia, which was similar. And you'd have all these people, and basically only the really, only really, really successful producers obviously could afford this stuff. But you'd have this kind of concentration of this kind of cutting edge technology, uh, and these people that could just about these people, these really talented musicians who could operate them, and I like the fact that Trevor Horn was. It was just epic stuff, mm. you know. And I, I still, aesthetically, I still love the maximal, you know. In this, in this, it's it's hard because kind of dance music at the moment is going through this kind of love affair with all things minimal. And I still like, I don't know, I like some stuff sometimes which is a bit, um, a little bit more. Yeah, a little bit bigger sounding, a little bit more, um, in some ways, yeah, bombastic or um, epic in some way. Um, I just, um, I just had my love of Trevor Horn um, tested somewhat because I did a, I did some work on a track for Pet Shop Boys' new album this summer, and then he basically got the job of producing the whole record, so. Uh, so I just lost a job to him, but but you know it's he's one of my all-time heroes, so I can't complain. <laughs> so was it right? Yeah. Um, but nevertheless, when you say maximization and bombastic sounds, when you take it back to probably the second time house music was around, and um, if you take a track like a Damski's Killer remix, uh -huh. um, you got whatever kind of noodly thing in the beginning with with some sweeps. And then the 909 kicks in, and just the sheer impact of that bass drum is just sending everyone into a frenzy. Yes. Now, with the way you would use a bass drum in your mix, 
it's slightly different, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I mean, there was a rawness about, especially about Chicago House and Acid, um, and there's an energy and an excitement behind that rawness, which was incredible, um, which is electric, but that you can't, um, a lot of those records, some of those records stand up today, but, you know, <coughs> things move on and... Um, <coughs> Basically, production, yeah, I think just production standards are much higher and the technology available to people, again, you know, at this level, is so, so, you know, is so much further that you really can't, I don't know, production values are much higher these days. Then you've got this, this excitement that you've got from the, the rawness and from the energy and this, the freshness, this was, this was something new. Um, and the, it was stripped down, and it was it had pre, you know, previously unheard. But it's so I find it kind of interesting that whereas, especially in four four bass techno kind of stuff, for a lot of times it was about the pure sen sonic sensation, the shock factor, the crassness, the harshness mm -hmm. of the sound. And I don't know if you take Riot or something like that, just that sheer energy. And when you, to some degree, a lot of that trying to um, maximize the impact on one particular sound happens in top 40 radio these days mm -hmm. with the Neptunes, Timberlands, Scott Storches and all that kind of stuff. Yes. And then when you go and see, let's say, hear your music in a club or the Matthew Johnsons or whatever, it starts to f somehow fade away or it suddenly it's a different sonic tactic working there. Um, yeah, I'm... I just, I guess I kind of want to have my cake and eat it in the sense that I want, I like to sort of, I like to stuff as much in there as possible without detracting from the fact that you've got to be, it's got to be insistent and it's got to, to move the crowd. You know, I want to have the song in there, I want to have development, I want to have chord structures, you know, um, and sometimes you do overcook it and you do put too many things in when sometimes it's better to keep things simple um, or keep things more stripped down. But yeah, I suppose it's kind of an, I suppose it's an aesthetic. Um, it's the, the thing you do first and foremost is, is please yourself and then you've got to square that with pleasing other people as well. Probably to take it out of that theoretic realm and can you, would you have an example of something where you had the feeling you were pleasing yourself and people were still liking it? Um, well, I can... Let me see what I got. Um, I did a remix <coughs> for... An example of this, of this sort of notion of doing a remix as an extended mix and not throwing out the baby with the bath water. I did a remix of Depeche Mode last year when they did their um, remixes um, project, their, mm. their big remix album. And I did a remix of the Enjoy the Silence. What was your favourite Depeche Mode remix before that? Remix? Um, I really liked the Francois Kevorkian stuff. I mean, he did so many, he did lots of theirs. Um, he did a remix of Policy of Truth, which I used to play mm. when I was younger. But, um, I was totally they disappointed by that one. I, I really, I just, but there's been so many, they have a, I mean, they do have an amazing history of, of mm. remixes and and there's a really good Adrian Sherwood mix off of yeah. later as well. The On You Sound dancehall yeah. classic thing, yeah. Yeah. But basically, I was, I mean, I, when I got that job, I, I was thinking, right, how can I do a remix which, because basically Enjoy the Silence was one of my favourite records of all time. Mm -hmm. And I always said that, I always said that I'd never do it. I always said that if somebody offered me like a real classic record like that to remix, that I, I wouldn't touch it. I remember um, DJ Hale did a remix of West End Girls for the Pet Shop Boys, and I remember writing a slightly, um, slightly rude DJ reaction sheet to it, saying you shouldn't mess with the classics and all this sort of thing. And then, of course, as soon as I get to Pesh Mode on the phone, like 20 seconds later, I'm like, yeah, 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 you know, panting like a dog. Um, but when I got to do the mix, I tried to keep as much of the original in. Um, as I tried to do, um, I tried to do a remix which would sound yeah, again, with this sound like an extended mix that almost could have been made at the time, 
but would fit into, <laughs> would still work in a contemporary club context. Even when you say you wanted a 1989 feel, it yeah. definitely is not a 1989 free or free use. I mean, it's, it's, it's like you put it behind a digital chastity belt, more or less. And, it's um, like, and, and, and it's, uh, I think the Trevor Horn bit probably explains that it's somehow put into a different realm. It's not, yeah, I suppose, it, I don't know. Um, and one of the great things about 303 is it's, um, it's an absolute bastard to program. <laughs> Um, I don't know if, ever, if, you, if any of you have ever used a 303. Um, one of the weird, weird things about it, and one of the reasons, one of the interesting things, the connections between, uh, between technology and, and the aesthetics they end up producing is that, you know, this, this machine was like a, this was a failure. This was designed as a sort of, designed <laughs> as an accompaniment for guitarists and sort of um, musicians. Um, he wanted to do a kind of, wanted to make sort of some kind of self-accompanying thing with this little other drum machine called a Dramatics. But basically, it's incredibly difficult to program. In order to program a bass line into it, you had to program it three times. So you had to program the pitches in first, then you had to program the rhythm in second, and then you programmed a succession of accents and slurs in. So, and you did all of this with a little keyboard, uh, these little silver keys in this box. Um, so you had to program it three times. So nobody did. <laughs> nobody, could, nobody could be bothered to learn how to use it. So um, it just became this kind of little sort of weird failure until, um, until guys like Marshall Jefferson and Spanky and people like that in Chicago started <laughs> using it. And, and, and they, started pro they started programming it in, at random. So they'd just be kind of putting patterns into it and, and, and putting pitches into it. And so one of the reasons why Acid House, when it started, was such, a, sort of, such weird, avant-garde sounding music, because it was basically very um, enharmonic. You know, it was just all kind of, it was like 12 note series or something. It was just like, this is just weird. Um, it was basically because this machine, just because of people messing around with the machine, which is so hard to program, um, produced this kind of crazy randomness. And then, you know, getting at it with filters and stuff. And so, you know, the, the, so an aesthetic, um, and so a kind of, yeah, this whole strange um, new dance form was born, basically out of the fact that somebody made this machine in many ways so badly <laughs> that it was impossible to get it to do what it was originally supposed to do. Nevertheless, when you use, the second you make the decision to use that machine, you're entering this whole world of references, and it's, um, I mean, it's like being in a guitar band and trying to replay Gang of Four, which do one or two bands do few, these few days. Few people doing that at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Or uh, I mean, if you use like a certain riff, you're definitely putting yourself into that block. That it's like, okay, there's been all this music that's been created with that particular sound, that particular feel, that shuffle, that rhythm, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So how do you go on and walk that line of creating something which is now, which sounds like 2005, or whatever the time is at that stage? Um, still keeping up. I mean, it's you could just. I think it's the same. Almost for the first stage in first time in electronic music, it's a heavy time where people have to decide whether they're going to be a Led Zeppelin cover band or not. Um, it's a it's a difficult decision. I mean, this this you know, you can go for the sort of modernist avant-gardist approach. Um, where the idea is always that it's got to be new, and it's got to be new, and it's got to be new. But at the same time, um, you forget about the other f music, you know, music has other functions. Um, and it, you know, it, it, it's possible, I don't know, I, the, one of the things I like about remixing is that I, I kind of, one can be a little bit more playful. So you can do it, you know, like I can decide to do an acid, you know, I can <coughs> decide to do an acid thing, Depeche Mode remix or something. I, I suppose I don't feel as, um, I don't feel as the need to be, because of it, it has this kind of commercial element to it, I suppose I feel the ability to be able to play slightly and not have to think about it from a kind of big A artistic point of view. But at the same time, you know, I, I do my best to make um, music that I love and that moves me. But um, 
yeah, I think one can be more playful, certainly, in the, in the remix field. Yeah there, yeah, there are always some people who, you know, some people will choose to do... Um, some people will choose to do one thing and push it um, in, in a, a kind of narrow way, and some people might choose to be more playful or um, referential. I mean, there's no, you know, all music refers out um, and refers to other things. It's very rare that you get the complete chuck of the new. Nevertheless, I mean, if you take, for example, another current album, like the recent Isolé thing, yes, it refers to a lot of similar things, but you draw totally different conclusions in the way you go on about sound design, for example. Uh -huh. Yeah, but that, re I mean, that, that's one of the great things as well. It's like how you, how you, um, how you process your influences mm -hmm. and how you, it's like, you know, you can give you can give people like ten records, ten samples or something and ask them to put it together and you know, they can still express themselves in whatever way. You know, Shadow will do it in a different way to um, whoever else. Um, yeah, it's what you make of your influences mm. and how you manifest them. How do you go about sound design? Um, I get my sounds from I don't know. I'm, I'm, I suppose I, I'm very much. I, I take what I can from wherever. Really, I um, I go through stages where I actually make. I'll have a session where I just make sounds, mm -hmm. like I'll sit with with a plugin like Reactor, um, and I'll make a load of kind of patterns, and I'll print them off as audio, and so I'll be making kind of material for future use. Or I'll do the same thing with sampling, you know, sampling um, beats or um, noises, you know, almost at random. Or I'll program something on, um, I have an SE1, like a mini Moog sort of analog synth, and I'll just have a session of programming some sounds on that for, for later on. But then, you know, I, I'm happy to admit to using presets. Um, I'll use anything that works in context, really. Um, sometimes you need things quickly and Nick looking through a band of presets, kind of um, a good way of doing it. Again, you know, certain people have a aesthetic where they say that they never use um, samples or they never use um, presets. They only use sounds that they've created themselves or programmed themselves, and that's great. Um, I kind of tend to think that it's the end result that matters, not necessarily the, the, um, the manifesto or the, the rubric by which you get there, you know. Um, it makes for entertaining reading. But. When you get to a commission to do a remix, how do you match the different aesthetics of the sounds of your sound bank and whatever you got in your studio and the raw material that you're getting? Um, I think you have amazing, an amazing wealth now of, with the advent of plugins and um, within something like Logic, you know, I've got an amazing amount of uh, mixing tools, you know, I can... How do you keep, prevent yourself from getting lost in, those, in that wealth of possibilities? Are you, well, you just, you, can, you could be there for, for weeks. I have been <laughs> at times. Um, but, but yeah, you've got the you've got the resources there to to be able to if you're careful about the way you pick your sounds, you've got the resources there to be able to marry um, new stuff and old stuff. Um, I think you know it's it's about the choice it's about the choices you make. A lot of the I suppose a lot of the reasons why people like the mixes that I do is that I'm careful about the sounds that I choose um, and how to put them together. It doesn't, hopefully it doesn't just sound like somebody, you know, a, some modern plug-in slapped on top of. Obviously a lot of the things that you get commissioned to do would be, let's say, a three and a half minute song and you have to turn that into something which is fit for a totally different em environment and obviously you got to totally change the scale and the time frame of what happens when in the track. Yeah. I mean, for something which should work at Bergheim, you need to take it totally out of the original world of the song context and restructure it in a... Yeah, it's kind of... Um, 
it's just it's kind of unfolding really if you I mean I was trying to think of it as like the, the original is there are so many elements packed so tightly and so arranged in such a in kind of miniature or, and it's kind of like you're sort of unfolding and, and it's a sort of yeah it's a process of opening out basically mm. um, and obviously in a club context um, repetition um, Repetition and boredom and the tension, you know, the technical <coughs> development, and uh, you know, this is this is where it's made. It's you know, it's not about getting everything across um, in three minutes. It's 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 about creating tension and um, teasing against that and satisfying and building up and breaking down and so forth. How do you keep yourself or prevent yourself from becoming a Armand van Helden type of conveyor belt remix machine? Um, say no. <laughs> um, two years ago, when I, when I sort of had, when it when it first, 2002 was this good, really good year for me, and then it kind of crescendoed into 2003. And by the middle, mid late, by the autumn of 2003, I was being offered three remixes a day. I think. How um, does your girlfriend get through on your phone if there's always these people there? <laughs> That's why you have a manager. No, I was being offered, yeah, I was being offered absolutely loads. And it, to be honest, a lot of it was just <coughs> said no to straight away. Everybody thinks, I mean, a, a journalist was writing about this and, um, and got it wrong and said that I'd done 80 remixes in a year. And it's like, no, I'd been offered, I think I'd been offered like 80 or 90 in a year, and I'd actually done seven. Well, you mustn't be mad lib if you've been like... Yeah, and that's well, we, Amir was talking about this last night, and you know, you get to the stage where you can make a choice, you can either say, right, I'm going to become a production line, and I'm going to become like you and Pierce and the brand. Mm -hmm. And I could have hired some engineers, and I could have um, set up like a couple of studios, and used like signature sounds and... Um, Death mix. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, that's how it's been done. Oh. But it, I'm, you know, I'm sort of, I don't know, I want my work to be me. Mm. And I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I don't, I'm not interested in empire building, you know, I'm not Sean Combs. I don't want to, you know, I just want to do. I just want to make I just want to make a living doing stuff that I like, and I'm happy to do to be very I'm happy to be picky and do seven remixes in a year and do seven remixes that I'm really proud of. Um, and so far, you know, I'm making a decent living, and you know, I, I could have really rinsed it in 2003, but I'm I'm more interested in having a longer career and and staying interested and you know. The, the danger is if, if you if you're lucky enough to get to that point where you have a successful period like that is that you just you go for it and you either burn yourself out or you just get really stale and everybody gets bored whereas i 2004 what i did was i basically threw away the not that there was a blueprint but i made a really really conscious effort that nothing i did in 2004 would sound anything like I done in 2003. So um, when you get to, I mean, you obviously um, Cedric, I think yesterday talked about um, Francois K going to New York at the end of the 70s, and people want to move from one country to the other. What happens with you psychologically when you start living in abroad? You don't understand the language per se. Um, um, I think for me. It had started a little bit earlier. It had started when I started to DJ a lot and travel hmm. a lot. And I think a lot of people experience this. That, um, when you st I don't know, you start to feel a bit more dislocated when, you start, when you've moved away. And I, um, London stopped feeling like such a home for me, to be perfectly honest. I mean, I can also, you know, there are lots of, there were lots of personal things <coughs> which changed in my li that changed in my life within a two-year period, including splitting up from a long-term girlfriend, and um, so I suppose you know if I'm going to sort of psychoanalyze, a lot of it was a delayed reaction to that as well, and just 
deciding that, um, I don't know, I wanted to make a positive out of some of the things that happened. And I, and I thought I've got to the age of 30 and I have no responsibilities and have just got to the stage where I've got this job that I can do wherever. So I think I'll have an adventure, go somewhere else. So when you say an adventure, I mean, most people will have the feeling that they're living in some place like Kidderminster or whatever, and you're thinking like, oh, I'm never going to get, you know, anywhere by staying here. And what sometimes happens, they just get on the road and start moving around, and they'll be in Barcelona for two years, and in London for two years, and New York for another year, mm -hmm. and so on and so on. And um, how do you prevent yourself from... I don't know, because I'm only two years into my, my wandering stage. You know, I lived a very sort of, a very boring, um, sedentary life in London for, for eight years. So um, I don't know if I will settle um, or whether I'll move back to the UK yet. There's a time in many people's lives when they have to decide, do I have a plan B, C, D and E? And I mean, you've got a plan PhD already in your pocket and you had some sort of a academic career and um, I mean you published a book which in the academic world is something like your door opener and what happened to Professor Pearson? Um, Professor Pearson <laughs> Professor Pearson, yeah Professor Pearson, he uh, decided that he decided to be a musician, decided to be a poor musician rather than a poor academic so your triple P, yeah, platinum pie piper. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's I don't know. As I said, that I'd never really had a master plan. It's been mm. my career has been kind of um, erratic, and uh, I basically always thought I was going to be involved in education or something. I thought I mean I was going to stay on at college and be a teacher, and um, music developed its own momentum, and. <laughs> Um, some of the academic work and the book was actually writing about music, so it, that was a it was great a cheeky way, way in. Then. Well, it was a good way of it. It was a good way of um, bringing together two of my interests. But at the same time, they didn't really meet in the sense that um, the book was published by an academic publishers, um, Routledge, and uh, no one dances to text. And no, and I was doing. I did my I did my album for Soma about the same time the book came out, and um, I didn't mention the book at all in interviews, because in the UK certainly there's certainly a kind of there's a bit of a there's an inverted snobbery, you know there's certainly a, there's, a, there's an anti intellectual or an anti analytical um, <coughs> prejudice in the UK certainly with regard to pop. When you are working on that kind of ambiences, you you have to behave in certain way, um, and I think uh, it, when you are starting, maybe you think one th one uh, you 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 have to behave in certain way, but you are wrong. So I will do. Uh, I will now. Which, which advices uh, they give you and you think is important for, for us to know? Thank you. Um, I'm trying to think. Good advice that I've had. Um, um, I just, I don't know, I'd, I'd say that um, the best advice that I can give is um, is to be making sure that you're doing, trying the best to do work that you love, um, and working with people that you trust. And if you don't trust them, then at least people that you respect or that you're um, you know, you're clear about um, what their job is and what your job is. Um, yeah, and, and also to be, from my point of view, I'm a self-employed musician, I don't work for anybody else. Um, 
that's what I wanted. And it's, it's sometimes hard to be doing it on your own. But um, it's a great job to be able to, to be able to be making music for a living uh, and not to be working for somebody else. So it's worth persevering. It's worth, it's worth sticking through the, the bits when you haven't got any money um, and your friends are doing jobs, you know, where they're earning. You know, the, my, you know I, I went to college with all these people and for the next sort of five or six years, they were all, you know, they were all like lawyers and God knows what. And I, you know, and I, all I could afford, I could afford to go to this. I remember my, my girlfriend at the time, was, uh, she was doing a PhD and I was a self-employed musician and we were like, we could afford to go to the cinema. We could go to the cinema once a week, have a pizza and that was it. And the rest of the time we were just in our flat, we were flat working and we just, you know, you'd fall out of, Society, and other people wouldn't see you because, but but it you know, it, if you really want to do it, it's worth persevering with. And I, in many ways, I'm really glad that that I've had my um, success such as it is when I've been a bit older. You know, I'm 33 now, and I didn't really start to 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 make a proper living from doing this until three years ago. But I think if it had happened to me when I was sort of 20, 21, when I'd first done it, and I'd probably turned into a, a horrific, um, egotistical so-and-so, whereas now I, I'm uh, <laughs> hopefully a little bit more, a um, little bit more modest about it, and I underst you know, understand that it, there's a lot of luck involved as well, so. Yeah, it's, you know, persevere, do what you love and, and realise that it's as much about luck as judgement, so, yeah, try and stick at it. When you look at uh, the evolution the DJs made, do you think that in the future the status of the DJ will be the same? Or it's more going to be like we're going to go to um, the people who make the music and invite those people instead of letting the DJ play the records. I think, I think you, I think you're right. I think to a degree that maybe has already happened in the sense that lots of DJs, you know, I was saying earlier, lots of DJs now, the new DJs that are coming through, tend to also be producers. So, um, in some sense, you are actually getting the people now who are DJ, the DJs are also the people who are producing the music. I think the sort of Certainly from a UK perspective, the, the age of the, the superstar DJs, you know, the one, I think that kind of era has, is, has ended a little bit that you sort of had in the mid 90s. I think um, certainly people don't get as big a fees <coughs> as they used to and a lot of the clubs that used to just survive by putting certain people on. I mean, obviously all those people are incredibly well established and make a lot of money still. Um, but I think things have been shaken up a little bit in the last couple of years. Um, I don't think it's necessarily healthy for people to be paid incredible astronomical as fees that they were being paid sort of four or five years ago. It certainly wasn't healthy for the club scene. And I think um, from the UK perspective and from, from Europe, what I, the places I know best, it seems to be, it seems to be a little bit more sensible again. But at the same time, people are, you know, people still do command large and ridiculous amounts of money for, for that. But then, I, you know, they spend a lot of time on the road and a lot of time away from home and various things. So I'm not, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to criticise their payments. But. Well, thank you, first of all. Mm -hmm.